at the heart of what I study is the question of how, particularly lately, how are we doing against Al-Qaeda? More than a decade after 9-11, there's still no consensus in answer to that question. People still argue about whether we're winning the fight against the Al-Qaeda movement, and very smart people disagree. Following the May 2011 death of Osama bin Laden, US officials claimed that the United States had decimated the Al-Qaeda leadership and reduced its ability to attack the United States. According to Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta, and I quote him, that the United States was, quote, within reach of strategically defeating Al-Qaeda. US counterterrorism chief John Brennan described Al-Qaeda as, quote, on the ropes. State Department counterterror coordinator Daniel Benjamin observed, quote, we believe that the loss of bin Laden will push Al-Qaeda on a path of decline that will be difficult to reverse. But there were others who sharply disagreed with that assessment, arguing that Al-Qaeda was changing shape, not ending. And there was official support for that view as well. The United States National Strategy for Counterterrorism, which was published about a month after bin Laden was killed, cautioned, quote, the preeminent security threat to the United States continues to be from Al-Qaeda and its affiliates and adherents. During his first testimony before Congress, CIA Director David Petraeus argued, quote, the CIA assesses that 10 years after the 9-11 attacks, the United States continues to face serious threat from Al-Qaeda and its worldwide network of affiliates and sympathizers, even though the group had been weakened. And British Security Service Chief Jonathan Evans warned that Al-Qaeda was using the Arab Spring to gain a foothold in the Arab world, quote, a new and worrying development that is likely to get worse. Now, analysts who are outside of government were even more strident in sounding the alarm bell. Former Bush administration NSC staffer Mary Habeck argued that Al-Qaeda, quote, is involved sometimes weakly and at other times in strength in every Muslim majority country in the world and that it was in far better condition on a global scale than at any time in its history. Some argued that talking about winning was only encouraging complacency. Another quote, these declarations of victory underestimate Al-Qaeda's continuing capacity for destruction. Far from being dead and buried, the terrorist organization is now riding a resurgent tide. And that was Rand uh, Corporation Analyst Seth Jones. So what in the world are we meant to get out of all of that? People are still arguing about exactly where we are with respect to Al-Qaeda. And we have this vast array of questions that terrorism pundits continue to debate. Has Al-Qaeda weakened or merely evolved and metastasized? What's the strategic significance of bin Laden's death? Is the outcome of Iraq and Afghanistan, are those wars, is it crucial? Is it crucial to countering terrorism against the United States? Is our homeland and our economic base secure? How about the Arab Spring? Is Al-Qaeda resurging in Libya or Syria or Yemen? Are our policies working? Is our, next, is our government ready and able for what comes next? Now, these are very difficult questions to answer, not least in the middle of an election campaign, where there's a lot of spin and a lot of turning of the answers to those questions in the direction that is politically expedient. Part of the problem with trying to decide how you're doing against a terrorist campaign is that they offer, these kinds of campaigns, offer very poor metrics. It's not enough to use the kind of classic military metrics that we're very familiar with, things like territory gained, casualties suffered, or leaders killed, because terrorist campaigns are meant to leverage a position of weakness. And there's no linear relationship between those kinds of metrics on the one hand and the ability of campaigns to accomplish their goals. Neither is it sufficient to think about classic law enforcement metrics, things like numbers of incidents, plots, foiled, successful prosecutions, we tried that approach, after all, before September 11th, and we concluded that the threat from Al-Qaeda was waning. And we were wrong. But you know, more to the point, objective numbers and assessments don't seem to make any difference. Following attempts by so-called homegrown operatives in 2009 and 2010, the American public have become so intolerant of risk that the next time there's a successful attack of any kind on an airplane or on US soil, the widespread view will be that we have lost and Al-Qaeda has won. 
Is that thinking strategically? Well, I don't think so. And so that's one of the reasons why I do my research. And what I'm here to offer is another kind of approach. I'm going to argue that with respect to Al Qaeda or any other terrorist group, you can't really know how you are doing unless you begin with a clear vision or an endpoint or an objective in mind. There are classic patterns of endings for terrorist campaigns. And once you recognize them, you can judge how you're doing. Today, the concept of grand strategy is very often mentioned, but it's little understood. But I think it's even more relevant to counterterrorism than it is or has been to many conventional wars. The best way to formulate a grand strategy, according to Basil Littlehart some 50 years ago, is to look beyond the war to the nature of the peace. And so likewise, what I'm arguing is that the best way to meet the current threat is to look beyond the international terrorist campaign inspired by Al Qaeda, beyond the short-term kinds of tactics that we've engaged against it, towards a broader view of how it will end. Processes of ending for terrorist campaigns have within them the best insights into which strategies succeed, which strategies fail, and why. But more than that, Thinking about the end is crucial, not just because it gives us a new perspective on what Al Qaeda is doing, but because it provides a new perspective on what we are doing. Studying how terrorism ends is the best way to inoculate ourselves against the strategies of terrorism, to avoid a dysfunctional action reaction kind of dynamic, to gain strength and perspective, and even possibly to know what it means to win. Now, before I go on, I have a couple of caveats. The first is that I'm certainly not arguing that terrorism as a phenomenon will end. That would be pretty stupid. I'm talking about specific groups and the processes of endings of those groups over the last couple of centuries. I'm also not arguing that Al-Qaeda is no longer dangerous. That's definitely not true. The purpose of my talk and of my research is to urge a broader mental framework to think more strategically about terrorism, to introduce more history and more, a more balanced perspective of risk, because that's the best way to deal effectively with any terrorist group. Now, my, my talk tonight is going to have three parts. First, I'm going to review four classic strategies of terrorism and discuss why democracies with a Western strategic tradition like ours have a particular difficulty responding to them. Second, I'll review a number of common myths about the endings of terrorist campaigns. And I'll show how the research that I've been doing indicates that they're wrong. In fact, I entered this research with a certain number of assumptions that proved to be incorrect. And I want to tell you what I found out and how wrong I was. And then finally, I'll talk briefly about the historical patterns or indicators that we can see with respect to Al Qaeda. So moving on. That's a picture of the Marine barracks bombing uh, on the 23rd of October in 1983 by Hezbollah. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. I really don't like PowerPoint all that much. But I'm going to talk about a lot of different groups. And the pictures are meant as a kind of a mental jogging of your memory about what the groups are and what they did. The first strategy of terrorism, and the one that most people assume all terrorist groups are using, is compellence. Compellence has been used by terrorist groups in, the, in support of very many different kinds of causes. But the natural assumption of governments is that there's a relationship between them and the group, a kind of a two-part relationship. They believe that the group is trying to use threats to influence that state, to do something or stop doing something, basically a carrot and stick, to use compellents to uh, stop doing an unwanted behavior or to start doing something that the terrorist group wants a state to do. And fitting terrorist group behavior into that same mental framework, that two-part mental framework that we're so accustomed to from nuclear theory, is very natural for a state. And sometimes it's accurate. 
For example, compellents might try to force states to withdraw from territorial commitments through a strategy of punishment and attrition to make them so painful that governments will abandon them. And at times, this has appeared to work. For example, the US and French withdrawals from Lebanon in 1983, not long after this. The US withdrawal from Somalia in 1993. And the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon in 2000. In each of these cases, you had a group that forced the state to withdraw from a piece of territory. Of course, that's an oversimplification in each of those cases. But terrorism is meant to oversimplify very complex situations, and the interpretation is compelling and interesting and, and uh, persuasive to broad audiences, not least those audiences in the West. And that's a major reason why it's put forth on the internet and over the airwaves. Compellence tries to change a state's policy. And given our 20th century experience with air power, Westerners find it very comfortably familiar. We tend to, to view compellence almost exclusively when we look at a terrorist group. I mean, if you look at the attacks of September 11, they seem an awful lot like strategic bombardment. They had the basic axioms of all strategic bombardments, comes right out of Douai and all of the subsequent air power theorists. Hopeless vulnerability of civilians to attack, the difficulty of effective defense against that attack, the benefits of sudden attack, and the need for retaliation. You can take that kind of mental thinking from the nuclear era and from strategic bombardment and air power and apply it right straight to a terrorist group and see it as a kind of a relationship between two sides. But the problem is sometimes we look at compellence so heavily, that two-sided framework, that we're missing a lot of what is happening strategically when it comes to the use of terrorism. Historically, there have been a lot of other reasons and other strategies involved when terrorism is used. And groups that rely primarily on terrorism don't have the luxury of behaving as if they were small states. They're not strong enough. So this compellence framework, which is developed mainly between two states, and all the theory that goes with it is mainly between two states, is not a promising way to reach the end of many groups. So I'm going to talk about other kinds of strategies that terrorism uses. And I'm going to focus on three, three strategies of leverage. Strategies of leverage reject this kind of two-part relationship between a state and a group. And they see a kind of a triad between a state, a group, and the third side is the audience, or many audiences sometimes. In terrorism, strategy is not the, just the application of means to ends because the reaction of the various audiences involved on that third side can be a group's means, or its ends, or both. Now, classic strategies of leverage. The first is provocation. This tries to force a state to react, to do something. Not a specific policy, but a vigorous action that works against its interests. And Provocation was very firmly established in the 19th century as a purpose for terrorism. It was very famously at the heart of the Russian group Narodnaya Volya, for example, the People's Will. Narodnaya Volya's goal was to try to attack representatives of the Tsarist regime so as to provoke a brutal state response and inspire a peasant uprising. Other cases of provocation include ETA, that the Basque group's uh, early strategy in Spain, the Sandinista National Liberation Army's uh, strategy in Nicaragua, to some degree the FLN strategy in Algeria. But provocation is a very difficult strategy to apply effectively, since terrorist groups often cause a state to behave in unforeseen ways. A government might be manipulated or provoked into unwise or emotion-driven action in the wake of a terrorist attack that serves no one's interests. And I would argue that this is what happened with the outbreak of the First World War. Now, I'm not saying that the only thing that was important to the outbreak of that war was a terrorist act. That would be very, very silly. But the international structure was such that there was a catalytic event, and that was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. It was an unimportant act. That assassination was one of many that had been endemic in the West for decades. Assassination was quite common, and in fact, very alarming. 
There had been the assassinations of the Russian Tsar, the French president, the Spanish prime minister, the Italian king. In 1901, the US president, McKinley, was killed, among many others. Can you imagine what it would be like today if we had that kind of a wave of assassinations? But in this case, that catalytic event had enormous implications. The young fellow, the 19-year-old Gavril Princip, who had pulled the trigger, never meant to set off a world war. And in fact, he lived out the First World War in a basement cell, sick and coughing and totally bewildered by what was going on. The point is that terrorism on its own is unimportant. But when it provokes a state, it can kill millions. And in that case, terrorism set off a cascade of state actions that resulted in a long and bloody war. Now, the next strategy, polarization, tries to divide and delegitimize a government, directing itself at the effects of terrorist attacks on the domestic politics of a state. It often drives regimes sharply to the right, and it forces populations to choose between the cause of the terrorist group and the government, usually. Oftentimes, the government, especially if it's engaging in brutal state repression, isn't a particularly attractive group to align with either. So the goal is to pry divided populations further apart, fragmenting societies to the extent that it's impossible to maintain a moderate middle and a functioning state. It's an intimidation of neutral civilian populations. The FLN in Algeria was particularly effective, especially as time went by, at doing this. And these, this is actually a picture from the, uh, these pictures are from the Battle of Algiers, if you know the movie by Ponte Gorbo. Uh, polarization is a particularly attractive strategy against democracies. And it's appeared regularly throughout the 20th century. Like the strategy of provocation, it often results in unintended consequences, though. Examples include the LTTE in Sri Lanka, especially in the early days, and the Provisional IRA in Northern Ireland. Terrorist activities in Austria, Germany, and Hungary after the First World War were likewise meant to polarize. But the classic example of a polarization strategy is the Tupamaros in Uruguay, uh, beginning in the 1960s, the early 1960s. This was a group that had an amazing effect upon a state that should have been immune to this kind of terrorism. Uruguay had a robust party system, an educated urban population, an established democratic tradition unlike any other in the region. If democracy were an antidote to terrorism, then Uruguay should have been immune. But the campaign polarized society and drove politics to the right. In response, the government suspended all constitutional rights and eventually turned to the army, which by 1972 had crushed the group. Even though terrorist attacks had ended, the Uruguayan army then carried out a coup, dissolved parliament, and ruled the country for the next 12 years. So in their short preeminence, the Tupamaros had executed one hostage and assassinated eight counterinsurgency personnel in a widespread campaign of kidnappings, robberies, and terrorist attacks. The right-wing authoritarian government that came to power under the military from 1973 to 1985 killed, maimed, or displaced thousands. So in that case, a polarization strategy drove the government to destroy itself. Now, the last strategy of leverage is mobilization. It's meant to recruit and rally the masses to the cause. Remember that audience side of the triangle? Key for this one. Terrorist attacks may be intended to inspire current and potential supporters of a group, again, using the reaction of a state as a means rather than as an end. And this is what the campaign of bombings and assassinations in the late 19th century did for the anarchist movement, and the 1972 Munich Olympics massacre did for Palestinian nationalism. When terrorist attacks are used to mobilize, they're not necessarily directed toward changing the behavior of a state at all. Instead, they're aiming to invigorate and energize potential recruits and raise the profile of a cause internationally, drawing resources, sympathizers, and allies. Now, this strategy of mobilization is particularly well suited for the 21st century's globalized international community, which allows groups to mobilize on a scale and at a speed that's never before been witnessed in history. And it also gets to the heart of why so many see this struggle with Al-Qaeda as being a multi-generational long war. I would argue that mobilization has been Al-Qaeda's most effective strategy thus far. 
in a globalized environment of democratized communications and increase in public access, a sharp reduction in the cost of messages, a growth in their frequency, and exploitation of images, groups like Al-Qaeda are able to use a kind of cyber mobilization to leverage the effects of terrorist attacks in ways that are unprecedented in history. If a group is really successful in mobilizing large numbers, this strategy can prolong the fight and may enable the threat to transition to other forms that are stronger than terrorism, frankly, like insurgency and even conventional war. So just to sum up, because terrorism is usually engaged in by relatively weak actors, non-state actors, there are far more examples historically of strategies of leverage by terrorist groups than any other type. A group may use a combination of several, occasionally even all of these strategies, but what a government does in response to each strategy is what gives it the power. Terrorism is the weak strategy of the weak that draws its strength from the actions of the state. And reactions that are taken in the narrow framework of one strategy may be counterproductive when it comes to the others. So it's particularly difficult and particularly important that a state understand exactly what the strategy a group is using is. Now one more thing about these kinds of strategies. There's a kind of historical pattern a kind of a temporal nature to them. Provocation especially suited the 19th century because of the nature of the aging autocratic regimes that it was oriented against. Terrorist groups always try to get at the weakness of a state. Whatever it is of that particular kind of state, today we would say the nation state. Terrorism is always aimed at trying to fray the fabric of that state. In the 19th century, provocation worked pretty well with these autocratic regimes because of their fragility. Compellants best fit the mid 20th century because it was very compatible with 20th century nationalist movements whose aims could be expressed in terms of territory. It went along very well with the decolonization that followed particularly the Second World War. Polarization was at the core of Marxist movements in the early years of the 20th century and it reappeared again at the end of the 20th century with terrorist attacks that were designed to polarize along racial, religious, tribal, linguistic or ethnic lines. And mobilization, as I've already said, is very well suited for the 20th, 21st century with its vast sweeping changes in communication and economic ties, porous borders, and the dramatic cultural and political developments. Now, Al-Qaeda is using all of these strategies, but it's especially trying to mobilize. Democracies aren't particularly well suited, in the short term at least, for handling the strategies of leverage. Counterterrorism strategies that are designed to prevent a state from being compelled by a group can break down if the goal is to provoke, polarize, or mobilize. Democracies aren't very well suited for responding to those kinds of strategies of leverage because they make decisions that reflect their constituents. That's at the heart of what they are. Many people focus on the natural breaks. We felt that we would have less terrorism at one point early in this campaign if we had more democratic states. But I would argue that unfortunately terrorism accelerates counterterrorism. It's very difficult to resist the kinds of emotions if you're a government official and there's a terrorist attack. Therefore, it's very difficult to see strategies of leverage but the good news with respect to democracies is that unless they grossly overreact and lose the support of their constituencies, democracies have a crucial advantage in dealing with the strategies of leverage over the long term. And that is the capacity to survive and to learn from trial and error. Of course, it's even better for states to skip the trial and error and to learn from somebody else's experience. And that's what my research is about to try to determine what that experience is. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about where this book came from. I, I'm, I'm rather short for this podium, so I'm gonna step out, and I hope this thing, is this working, Andrew? Okay. Um, the reason why I wrote this book was that I was a, an advisor for members of Congress, and um, not too long after 9-11, uh, I was responsible for explaining all kinds of questions 
answering any kind of question that came up with respect to terrorism. So this would sometimes be, you know, very small questions like, you know, what is Hezbollah and what's, how many attacks have we had in X, Y, or Z period and what's the latest threat and so on. Or it would be larger questions. And this book came out of one of the larger questions that I was asked. There was a senior senator who uh, called me to his office and said, Audrey, I have been going from briefing to briefing, hearing about the danger of another attack. I don't know anything about Al Qaeda. I don't really know much about the Middle East and regional politics. I don't particularly understand this group. But all I can feel is that I'm getting one set of alarmist predictions after another, and I don't really know how to think about them. I realize that we're under threat of attack. I realize that this is a very serious situation, but can you talk to me? Can you give me some kind of broader framework so that I can think about terrorism other than from the 10 o'clock to the 3 o'clock meeting? And I thought, whoa, you know, why don't you just ask me about how many attacks we've had by, you know, Etta lately? <laughs> this is a hard question. But I said, well, sir, you know, the good news is that terrorism does end. And you can think of these groups as following a kind of a trajectory. And if you keep your mind on the fact that eventually Al Qaeda will end and think about how we might best push it toward that end, it'll be easier for you to see what we're experiencing right now, because we were still very much under threat from a broader perspective. So then I, I you know, I, I talked to him for, for a while, and then I put this idea away. And the reason why I was able to write the book was that I went off to Oxford University where I could have a little bit of time away from all the frenetic uh, things that go on, particularly within the Beltway, and all the need to respond to short-term uh, and very real threats with respect to terrorism and think about it more broadly myself. So that's why I wrote the book when I was at Oxford. And it helped me a great deal to have a different kind of a framework. But um, there were a number of things that I found out in doing this research that um, I had believed before I started, and they proved to be untrue. And the first was that dealing with the causes of terrorism will always lead to the end. Studying the ends of hundreds of groups, what strikes you is that the roots of a campaign are not as important to its ending as most people think. Now, let me tell you, this was a real disappointment to me because I had done a lot of work on the causes of terrorism. So have most people who study terrorism. It's the most popular thing to study. So frankly, it was a bummer. But there's a weak relationship when you look at the beginnings and the endings. The historical record flies in the face of the belief that the causes of a terrorist campaign persist throughout its whole, whole lifespan and then are crucial to ending it. Far more often, the reasons why a group initially launches a campaign against noncombatants evolve over time, and they're only loosely related to why the group ends. Terrorist campaigns rarely achieve their initial goals, and external factors are often eclipsed by evolving dynamics within a group. So most often, those strategic, those outcome goals, those things like uh, popular suffrage, self-determination, minority rights, a new system of government, and so on and so forth, some of which are very admirable goals. Those things are sidelined during the course of a campaign, and they're replaced by tactical goals. Things like revenge, retaliation, protecting sunk costs, consolidating a group, competing against another group, and so on. The launching of a campaign, in other words, alters the landscape in ways that are irreversible. And when a campaign's already underway, it's very important for policymakers to be aware of the kind of give and take that is going on and to recognize their part into, in it and to adapt to it and focus on a conclusion. It's also crucial that they be aware of the audiences that, that are observing the campaign and how they're reacting not only to what the group is doing but also to what the government is doing. But in short, what I found out is that understanding the causes of terrorism may be no more important to understanding how a terrorist campaign ends than understanding the causes of wars is to ending wars. Naturally, the question has some relevance, but it's overshadowed by the dynamic of the conflict itself as it unfolds. Second myth, that terrorism is completely situation dependent and can only be understood 
by looking at a particular narrow specific group region or cause. When Al Qaeda appeared, you may remember that everybody said it was unique. Terrorist campaigns, though, have a kind of contagion effect. And they're designed with the lessons of predecessors or even contemporaries in mind. In Al Qaeda's case, for example, there are scores of cross cultural, cross regional, lessons learned kinds of studies that have been done by members of the movement. And those that are translated into English alone cover groups as disparate and unlikely as the Red Army Faction, the Red Brigades, the Janjaweed Movement in Southern Sudan, leftist movements in Central and South America. So especially in our globalized age, groups that use terrorism study and mimic other groups that use terrorism. And there are similarities and differences between them. And the reason to study them comparatively is because you figure out what those similarities and differences are. And then the last myth is that terrorism is especially dangerous and more likely to persist now. Some people argue that what's most important and impressive about terrorism is not that it ends, but that groups endure and demonstrate resilience. There's been quite a lot of writing on that in recent years. But are groups that use terrorism really all that successful? In the research that I did, I studied hundreds of groups. I was very careful about how the groups were selected. I left out groups that had only one attack or only one small set of attacks or only attacked economic targets. I would, in other words, I tried to really feel that I was looking conservatively only at groups that had carried out attacks on non-combatants for political reasons. Of the 475 groups that I ended up with in my database that deliberately targeted non-combatants and engaged in a series of attacks and so therefore had a campaign, the average lifespan was about eight years. And the degree to which they achieved their aims was even more remarkable. In my study, only a very small minority, about 5%, have by their own standards succeeded in achieving their aims, even aims that evolved over the course of a campaign. So the good news is that terrorism is not a promising vocation. It always ends. So let's talk about how it ends. And here I'm going to talk about the patterns of endings, six patterns of endings that I studied. The first one is decapitation, the capture or killing of a leader. There are numerous examples where getting rid of a leader has had huge implications for the decline or the ending of a group. Cases of arrest include Guzman in the Shining Path. He's the guy in the striped pajamas on the upper left. Shoka Asahara and Amshin Rikyo on the bottom left. Cases of assassination include the Philippines' Abu Sayyaf, Russia and Chechen separatist leaders, and Israel's so-called targeted killings. Sometimes uh, decapitation backfires. It creates a martyr and it mobilizes that third side of the triangle, public opinion, in ways that are unpredictable. Uh, there are several conclusions from this part of my research. In undermining a group, a humiliating arrest, I believe, is more effective over time than is killing the leader. Groups that have ended through decapitation have been hierarchically structured, characterized by a cult of personality, younger, generally, on average, than other groups, and lacking a viable successor. Well, that makes sense. Now, unfortunately, none of this describes Al Qaeda. Of course, we've had some cases of very famous cases, of course, of assassination or targeted killing, bin Laden on the left and, and uh, Anwar al-Laki on the right. Uh, I really can't go past this particular part of the study without mentioning something on drones. Uh, I'm all in favor of stopping people who are actively trying to harm Americans, but the use of drones is a tactic, not a strategy. Yet, it's having very important strategic effects from the perspective of the United States. And these strategic effects are not being carefully analyzed. Whatever you think of the tactic, it is changing our force structure. The US Air Force trained 350 drone pilots in 2011, which was more than the total number of conventional fighter and bomber pilots being trained, which was 250. There are 16 drone operational and training sites across the United States right now, and 
from California to North Dakota to Ohio, New York, and so forth, and a 17th is being planned. This is a very serious shift in our force structure. Secondly, it's challenging our legal framework, especially with the controversial killings of three US citizens abroad. And finally, it's removing a proven tool of counterterrorism. There's no ability to collect human intelligence from someone who is dead. There's no ability to demonstrate the effectiveness of the rule of law either. So most important, on the basis of the historical evidence, there's no reason to believe that this will end the Al-Qaeda movement. Second pattern of ending, negotiations, transition toward a more legitimate political process. Negotiations can lead to the achievement of some aims of a group and a short-term decline in terrorism. Some examples are the provisional IRA with the 1998 Good Friday Accords, that's up on the left, Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement on the right, the Tamil Tigers and many others. But of course, as is very obvious from those examples, it's far more complicated than just the pursuit of a negotiated agreement. With talks, the long-term goal, which is a viable political outcome, and the short-term goal, which is a reduction in violence, may be at odds. In other words, in the process of engaging in negotiations, you can have an increase in the amount of violence, and that's very common. Now, some conclusions quickly of that research. Only a small percentage of groups negotiate at all, about 18% overall of the group that I had, the 475. These tend to be the longest life, longest lived groups. That makes sense. They had a longer average lifespan than the, than the others. It was about 20 to 25 years. Obviously, the group has to hang around long enough for a state to think it's essential to have to negotiate with it. It's also interesting that of those 18% that negotiated, only one in 10 had the talks failing outright. But on the other hand, very few groups can be said to have achieved their aims. The predominant pattern for any negotiation that involves a terrorist group is for talks to drag on with some lower level of violence without resolution or outright failure. So it can be thought of as a kind of diversion of the violence to another cha channel, while oftentimes another dynamic enters to gather in the picture and work together with negotiations. Note that these six patterns are not mutually exclusive. You can have more than one pattern underway. Here's an example of a negotiated agreement that just happened on October 7th between the MILF and the Philippine uh, government. We'll see what happens with that. There's certainly a lot of potential spoilers, but um, there has been a diversion of the violence. There's no question. The study of negotiations concludes uh, by laying out seven promising and unpromising conditions for negotiations, and they're all drawn from the case studies. Of the promising, I'm sorry, of the unpromising, things that make it very hard to negotiate are suicide attacks, Splintering on either side, that is, on the group side or on the government side. You can also have splintering on the government side, after all, if there's an uh, inability to have a coalition to be able to engage in negotiation. Spoilers are another unpromising element for any negotiation, not, of course, not just their presence, but whether the negotiating parties respond to them by ceding them the power to disrupt the talks. But there are four promising conditions that appeared across many, many cases. The first was the existence of a political stalemate in the conflict, strong leadership on both sides, third party sponsors or mediators, and the broader setting with respect to the ideology of the group. That is, whether there's a broader historical context supporting the cause, like the wave of decolonization following the Second World War, supporting nationalist groups at the end of the Cold War. Of course, everyone is wondering the degree to which negotiations are relevant with respect to the Taliban. The Taliban are not Al-Qaeda, but there are connections. There will be no negotiating with the core of Al-Qaeda, but with local groups, in each particular case, negotiations have to be considered with respect to the local aims with respect to that case. The Indonesians, the Jamaa Islamia, in Turkey, in Malaysia, in the Philippines, with Abu Sayyaf, moderate Kashmiri groups, the Uyghurs, these are all actors who have slightly different aims with respect to what they would negotiate over. It's impossible to gloss over all of the local groups that have some potential 
association or some attachment even with Al Qaeda and to draw broad conclusions about whether negotiations with those groups would work or not. It's crucial to be able to discern and to disaggregate and determine where there's daylight between the core of Al Qaeda and its interests and uh, stated goals and individual local factions, which oftentimes want something entirely different. The next factor, the third, is success. This is always a sensitive point. Sometimes organizations that have used terrorism fulfill their aims. There are two uh, fairly well-known cases. These are Umkanto, which is the military wing of the African National Congress, and Orgun, with the establishment of the State of Israel. But the achievement of strategic aims is extremely rare. I already mentioned that only about 5% achieve their aims, even by their own standards. And it's not a scenario that will happen with Al Qaeda. And here's a very famous picture of the King David Hotel on um, the 22nd of July, 1946, when it was uh, blown up by Ergun. There were 91 killed, mostly civilians, and 46 injured. Next pathway, <clears throat> excuse me. Failure. There are two big subcategories under failure. The first is implosion. Implosion includes the failure to survive across generations. This is often the case with right-wing groups. Infighting, as with the GIA in Algeria. A breakdown into factions with respect to the uh, Palestinian groups, that was the case. Um, arguments over operations, the Red Army faction was famous for those. And breaking apart over ideological differences. Uh, Combat 18, which is a right-wing group in the United Kingdom. But there also are, on the other hand, lots of reasons why popular support is lost. There's implosion on the one hand and popular support, which is a second reason for failure. Reasons why popular support is lost include things like government counteraction, such as in Chechnya, where it just becomes too expensive, too difficult for anyone to support the groups because there's such repressive action. Offer of a better alternative, reform movements, spending, jobs, but that's a very complicated calculation because sometimes reform results in increased instability and a sense of opportunity, which is exactly what happened with the social revolutionaries in late 19th century Russia. A sense of historical relevance might have been lost with respect to uh, Marxist groups, uh, their loss of state sponsorship. Groups can die out, as I mentioned, between generations, but most important of all, and very interesting, is the pathway of a terrorist group's own miscalculations, targeting errors. You see this over and over again with respect to the history of terrorism. Terrorist attacks cause revulsion among their intended constituency. Uh, here in this picture you have a, the aftermath of the Oma bombings in um, Northern Ireland. The real IRA engaged in the Oma bombings, killed 29 people, 11 children, injured more than 300. And uh, I'm sorry, the quality of these pictures isn't too great, but you can see here Catholics and Protestants who all flocked to this funeral here on the upper right. Uh, there was a, one family that lost um, three generations, a uh, grandmother, a uh, mother who was pregnant, and a number of children. Uh, the entire community was so appalled that the real IRA, Mickey McKevitt, who had originally claimed credit for these attacks, came out right thereafter and said, oh, no, 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 we really didn't mean it, and we, we made a mistake, and, you know, sorry. Um, and he was captured not, not too uh, long after that. So there's a kind of a relationship oftentimes between this repulsion in the aftermath of a targeting error and the ability to um, take other actions against a group because the population turns against it. Uh, the GAI's killing of 62 tourists in Luxor, Egypt is another example of popular repulsion. The Red Brigades in Aldo, Mor Aldo Moro, you may remember. The um, PFLPGC, the Palestinian group, with a Swiss Air flight to Tel Aviv, uh, Sikh separatists in India. All of these are cases where popular revulsion helped to cause the failure of the group. Now, with respect to Al Qaeda, this is a very promising dynamic. And in fact, a lot of it has already unfolded. There's a lot of infighting among members of Al Qaeda about issues like whether or not it's appropriate to kill Muslims, 
whether or not to call other Muslims apostates, uh, whether or not it's okay to attack the economy. Um, there's also historical irre irrelevance when it comes to Al-Qaeda's cause and a loss of popular support that has been unfolding before our eyes. Uh, if you look at the figures on public opinion, according to the Pew Global Attitudes Project, between 2003 and 2011, support for bin Laden had dropped in Indonesia from 59% to 26%, in Jordan from 56% to 13%, in the Palestinian territories from 72% in 2003 to 34% in 2011. In Pakistan, where bin Laden was actually hiding, support for him went from 46% in 2003 to 18% in 2010. And general support for al-Qaeda dropped from 25% in 2008 to 9% in 2009 over the course of one year. And the Pakistanis are the strongest public voice against suicide attacks. In the wake of the September 11th attacks in the United States, one third of Pakistanis supported suicide attacks, quote, to defend Islam, unquote, but in 2009, 87% said that such attacks are never justified. So it seems that experiencing Al-Qaeda's violence up close and personal results in a popular backlash against the group. Fifth pathway, repression, both internal and external. Um, internal repression, you might uh, think of uh, Turkey and the PKK uh, some years ago. And with respect to um, external repression, um, perhaps Israel and Lebanon in 1982. Um, repression has resulted in a number of groups, uh, Norod Nailvolya, Sendero Luminoso, and attempts with respect to the Chechens, a number of those groups ending. The problem is, of course, that it may export the problem to another region. With respect to the Chechens, it exported the problem to Ingushetia, for example. It's very difficult for democracies to sustain repression. It works best in places where group members can be separated from the general population, so there has to be a clear target. It often requires profiling or discrimination, so it places a huge fabric upon the very nature of the state, a huge uh, strain upon the fabric of the state. And it goes against civil liberties and human rights, placing a strain. Uh, the Tupamaros would be the example here. It's very high cost repression. It's just extraordinarily difficult to maintain the effort. And finally, if the cause continues, the group does not end merely through the use of force. We've already seen the limits of this kind of approach with respect to Al Qaeda. And in the picture, you see uh, the Beslan School massacre, if you recall. Um, and uh, this picture also comes from there. This little girl lived, you'll be happy to hear. So the final pathway is reorientation. And that's a transition out of terrorism by the group into some other form. Groups can transition to criminal behavior. Abu Sayyaf, the FARC are examples, perhaps even Northern Ireland. Um, obviously, it's not distinct, there's no dis clear bright line between terrorism and criminal behavior, but we can look at the central driving purpose oftentimes of the use of violence. And that does change, or shifts at least. Or instead of going into criminal behavior and becoming a criminal group driven mainly by profit, uh, groups can escalate to a full insurgency or even conventional war, especially if they're supported by the state. And this happens when the group is able to control the behavior of a state according to its own interests or even when an act of terrorism has completely unintended consequences, as we saw with the outbreak of World War I. And we worry about this with respect to Kashmir and India and Pakistan. Now, some have argued that with the current uh, counterterrorism approach, this may have already happened to Al Qaeda. There are a number of people who believe that Al Qaeda is a global insurgency. If that's the case, it's a very bad outcome. That's why I think it's very counterproductive to speak of this movement as a global insurgency because it bestows legitimacy on it. Insurgents are legitimate warriors. Terrorists are not. Uh, it forces us to defend regimes we may not like. And it makes the United States into a kind of pseudo-occupying power. It emphasizes territorial control. Still, it's very important to remember that Al-Qaeda has already catalyzed two conventional wars. And I fear 
that transition to insurgency could be what is happening in Syria. These pictures are from 7-7 uh, in, um, in London. I came to uh, Oxford right after those happened. So the point of all of this is that I'm arguing that Al-Qaeda is either going to implode or transition. And it's in our interest to push it as far as possible in the direction of implosion. Now, how do you do that? Well, first of all, you need to articulate our Al-Qaeda. That is, to clarify exactly what it is and what it is not, particularly in the aftermath of attacks. We shouldn't use the name to apply to every group that claims an association or whose attack Al-Qaeda claims. Exploit internal cleavages. Push toward failure. Try to ensure that the things that we do don't, don't drive operatives together. Hive off constituents, particularly when, you come, when you're talking about individual affiliates. Those affiliates have interests and gains, uh, goals and objectives that are quite different from those that were expressed by bin Laden and also now by Zawahiri. Spotlight al-Qaeda's mistakes. This miscalculation, this poor targeting, if you will, is something that we've been very bad at um, emphasizing. Look at local aims. Disaggregate this, this broader problem. And facilitate or work with the backlash. Or at least avoid making the kinds of mistakes that prevent it from happening. Al-Qaeda is already undergoing quite a number of different aspects and dynamics of implosion. It's dangerous and it can still hurt us very badly, but it's declining very sharply, the core, because of its own serious mistakes and bad targeting. It's, it has killed large numbers of Muslims. It's attacked the economy. It's engaged in sectarian targeting. The divergence between its goals and those of its allies or affiliates is very blaring, glaring. Its historical irrelevance has become very apparent with respect to the Arab Spring. Regardless of what happens in the aftermath of those revolutions, the Al-Qaeda factions are not winning the argument. Its failure to mobilize public support, as you can see from the polls that I cited, and there are many others among the Gallup organization and other Pew polls as well. And then, of course, the death of its leader and its senior operatives, which have weakened it. So our goal is to hold up al-Qaeda's strategy to the light because it's ultimately self-defeating. It's killing the very people on whose behalf it claims to be acting. But in, addi in addition to that, we also have to work on the resilience of our own population. As long as we continue to be as fragile as we are with respect to understanding what the nature of the risk is, as long as we continue to react so dramatically every time there's an attempt, never mind a successful attack, we become all that much more attractive to launch an attack against. It's a very bad dynamic. And the United States needs to develop much greater resilience with respect to Al Qaeda and every other kind of terrorism. We need to replace fear with knowledge and education. That's one reason why I, I teach in this program. We need to desensitize publics to reduce panic and develop aftermath plans. We need to develop a productive awareness of what's going on and push governments to release more information as objectively as possible. And finally, to be candid about the risk, what we know and what we don't know. Because there's a gross imbalance between actual objective risks and perceived risks. And that's the kind of imbalance, particularly in a democracy, that terrorism is designed to exploit. So, I believe that instead of winning hearts and minds, what we most importantly need to do is facilitate Al-Qaeda's tendency to lose them. The bottom line is, what would an Al-Qaeda future mean? So just to sum up, the important question for policymakers in the middle of any terrorist campaign is not how are we doing. That's the one I started with, and I think it's the wrong question. Instead, it's how will it end? And understanding strategies of leverage, it's not when will the next attack be, but what will we do after that? The strategies of terrorism emerge in and reflect unique historical, political, and social contexts that are constantly evolving.
but groups end in certain consistent ways. And the crucial challenge is to determine which of the patterns of endings fits a particular group, to work with that process as it unfolds, and to push it further in that direction. Policymakers who become caught up in the short-term goal and the spectacle of terrorist attacks, looking at it strictly from the point of view of compellents, relinquish that broader historical perspective that's crucial to the reassertion of state power and legitimacy. Terrorism's classic strategies of leverage are very deliberately designed to take advantage of that, to exploit those mistakes. Consciously driving a terrorist campaign like Al-Qaeda's toward its end is much better than answering the tactical elements of the movement as it unfolds, and it's also far more likely to succeed.